This video is sponsored by Acronis. Well, 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 we meet again Syndico, aka my favorite spot to order weird Japanese mystery tech. So those couple times we've gone in Syndico, we found absolutely insane items that I've never seen before direct from Japan. So today, we're taking it up a notch. I'm going, I'm going to the, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this after one. Um, ah, I'm ascending Mount Fuji today to find the greatest tech the Japan has ever made. Yeah, you heard me right. All of the good Japanese tech is on top of Mount Fuji and we have to climb it. This isn't working. Let's just go through video games. Let's see what they've got. Wait, let's start out with Game Boy. Safe, easy bet. I need some Game Boy action. Oh, a Game Boy printer? That's pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. Okay, you know what? Maybe I need this. It's a boxed copy of Pokemon Emerald. That's just really neat. Does it come with everything? Oh, it does. It comes with a little, um, the wireless thing. Oh, I want that for sure. What is this? A PCE PC engine, but it's a handheld. What? Working item overhauled. All electrolytic capacitors replaced, contacts, and internal cleaning completed. Oh, but because of the low audio output of the right channel, we will be listing as defective. Are you trying to tell me that they have replaced capacitors, clean contacts, cleaned everything, but because one speaker's a little quiet, it's sold as junk, basically. Man, I love Japan. If this is GameStop, they'd be like, oh yeah, we just spit on it and toss it in the box. Congratulations. I don't think GameStop actually spit on things, but sometimes it feels like they probably should. Look at this. They say it's for parts, but it's a little Windows 95 PC in here. I told myself after the last time we did Sendico, I was gonna go easy this time. I lied to myself, because I want all these things. So with that, my friends, I will see you on the other side once our very large, very heavy package from Sendico has arrived. And so we have uh, our items from Sendico. Now, much like last time, the shipping was expensive. These boxes all combined were something like, it was well over 100 pounds. I wanna say it was like something like 80 or 90 kilos. Like it is massive. There's some very big, heavy, expensive items in here. And initially, when I went to go check out with the parcel, Sendico quoted me, $780 for this to be shipped via DHL. Thankfully, much like last time, they then gave me a cheaper option after the fact. They emailed me and say, hey, we can actually ship this to you via FedEx for like $340, which is still expensive considering that this is all over 100 pounds of packages shipped in three days from Japan. It's not bad. Let us begin with the small box. Oh, oh no. Dang, I accidentally ordered Pokemon cards again. Ah! Oh. <laughs> so I'll just uh, <clears throat> put this over here and just. Uh... Next up, we have something that I'm quite excited for. So this is a Game and Watch. Now, if you're not familiar, the Game and Watch was sort of the first Nintendo gaming device. That's kind of debatable because Nintendo made like playing cards and games and stuff. But this is one of their first electronic games. Game and Watch. So if this was kind of familiar, like a uh, Game Boy Micro or the bottom part of a DS, that's because they took heavy inspiration for this in later Nintendo handhelds. But this was before the NES, this is before the Game Boy. This is a much more rudimentary style of console because it uses actual like little like LCD elements, but it's not an actual like screen in the traditional sense. Every single element that could be on screen is programmed, so it just turns it on and off. Um, but this specifically is the Popeye variant, which was like, on the expensive side. I do know that. We paid like 50 bucks for this thing? Uh, <laughs> Five zero. So what we paid for it was almost 14,000 yen, which roughly Ooh. equates to 93 US dollars. <laughs> Did I mention that this is a great time to subscribe to the Austin Evans YouTube channel? We spend lots of money on cool tech, so you don't have to. Now that we have acquired some LR43 batteries, let us try our Popeye Game & Watch. Oh, well it immediately works, I'll tell you that. Yay. Oh, oh, where are I playing? Oh, okay. Oh no, the left button doesn't work. Look, yeah, I try to push right, he always goes left. So I think what the problem here is, is that while it is in good condition, generally speaking, I think that this button is just broken, so it's always pressing the left button. That's my hope, because otherwise, it's like broken, broken. A huge thank you to the sponsor of this video, Acronis. Acronis Cyber Protect Home Office is still one of the best data backup and cyber protection personal solutions on the market, but now with identity protection. Cyber criminals are getting smarter and even using AI to enhance their attacks. In 2022, over $10 billion has been stolen through identity theft. 
Think it won't happen to you? You're vulnerable even when ordering food online, shopping, or booking a flight. Thieves can use your personal data to open new accounts, take over existing ones, falsify taxes, and commit insurance fraud all in your name. Don't let that happen to you. Recronus provides real-time monitoring and alerts for identity theft attempts. But just in case anything does happen, Acronis' certified experts are available to help you restore your losses and identity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with up to a million dollars in identity fraud insurance. So if you need award-winning backup software, malware protection, and now identity theft all in one easy-to-use dashboard, Acronis has your back. Just use code AustinEvans2023 for a 40% discount, which can be used for all home office products, and thank you very much to Akronis for sponsoring this video. Next up we have this. This is the Fujitsu FM Notebook. Then you might look at this and think it looks ancient and old and thick, but considering that this is from the late 80s, it actually is, in my opinion, pretty sleek. Now, the problem here is that it came as is untested. And as we've tried to look this up, there, surprise, surprise, is no information about this, like, anywhere. Um, so not only do I need to figure out how I'm going to power it, I have no idea what kind of operating system it has. It does say uh, HDD here, so it's got obviously a floppy disk drive, but also it says hard drive. So I'm assuming it may actually have a hard drive inside. I can hope that it's running some version of DOS, but I know literally nothing about it besides it's in really, really good condition. How much was our FM R50 NBX? Uh, it was pretty reasonable for basically a museum piece. Uh, it was 7,980 yen, which is roughly about 54 US dollars. For 54 bucks, I'm happy to take the gamble that we can find some way of getting this up and running. So the first thing I'll do is just see if I can get it to power. So we have a couple of like little generic adapters, but the problem is, is that this is quite specific in what it's looking for. It's like 14, uh, sorry, 13.5 volts. So I'm gonna try to see, I have an actual switching adapter, my Schnitt Power Professional Power Supply, which will actually allow me to adjust the voltage to precisely what the system needs. Theoretically, when I plug this in, some of these lights, the DCN light and battery light will turn on. So here goes nothing. Mm. Oh, wait, wait, hang on, there's a main switch over on the side. Maybe that turns on the power. Oh, yes, yes! So it is on. Right? Hang on, so it is a very clearly not good screen. So you can see I've got a wheel to adjust my contrast. So power and DC are in. It's not charging the battery, but that's fine. And I've got a little bit of text on the bottom. Unfortunately, that little bit of text doesn't look like it's uh, hey, I am booting right now. It looks like an error message. Hey, right, what does it say? Please set up the system. Oh. Uh, I was afraid of this. Um, <laughs> Physically, it seems like it's in terrific shape. And clearly it functions now that we have some power for it. But um, until we're able to track down some 35-year-old Japanese floppy disks, I think it's gonna be nothing more than a beautiful set piece. This is something I'm very excited about. The PC Engine is so damn cool. How much did I pay for my super duper cool PC Engine? 15,000 yen or roughly 102 USD. I mean, that's a fair bit of money, but this thing I think is really cool. Okay, one thing I don't understand is how you disconnect this. So that's the power for it. Oh, oh, I got it, I got it. Hey. That's so cool. Also, you can see how yellow it is, because it used to be this color, now it's this color. So essentially, it is a CD player and a CD-ROM drive, and then when you're ready, you just load it up here and attach it in. Dude, this is worth every penny. Honestly, this is why I do these videos. How cool is this? Okay, so I'm gonna go explore this PC Engine. We're gonna start out by trying to use the actual base console itself. So, I'm gonna take our game, load it in here, and then if I power it on, theoretically this will work. Ooh, okay, well that is a signal. I am pretty confident there's a way that we could make this work. Let's though go with the safe bet of loading it into our interface unit and then we'll try the CD. So this little lock, so this is the little piece of plastic that holds everything in. It is also a power switch for the entire unit. So you see? So basically you flip the little lock up to keep everything into place and you slide it to the side and it turns the power on. Hey! hey! So now I get to experience F1 Circus World Championship with the 
full glory of an actual RGB television and music. Dude, look how clean these graphics are. This is clearly meant to be somewhat more realistic than the normal kind of um, very arcadey kind of racers of the day. Okay, so we can establish that this works really quite well. So I've got not one, not two, uh, but three? How many PS2s did I buy? You bought a total of five PS2s, <laughs> so you're still missing one. Did I? Keep, keep hmm. digging. I wonder why my shipping was so expensive when I bought five PS2s. All right. So with everything unboxed and prepped, let me run you through what I've got here. So this is the larger lot. So just to recap, we've got ourselves a Sega Saturn, PS1, two N64s, Super Famicom, a Famicom in the box, and three PS2s. How much did I pay for these in US dollars, please? Because <laughs> I remember the yen and it was a lot of yen. So it, it, it wasn't exactly cheap, but I mean, I think it's still pretty reasonable at $177 US. For one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine consoles? That's like, 20 bucks a console, not even. Now, this was a much more reasonable lot. Two PS2s, a Wii, all the various peripherals and accessories and stuff. I think, I, I paid like 20 bucks or something for this, right? Yeah, it was very cheap at $16 for those three. I'll be honest, that's cheap enough. I would pay five bucks just for these to have them for parts or just to display them on a shelf or something, but, it would be nice if they actually function. So, now it is time to test some of the lot of consoles, starting out with our very mini PS2s. Okay, load it up. This drive doesn't sound great, I will admit. It does not sound great. Oh, hey, okay, we got it. I've never seen this game before. Oh, that's fun. All right, we well, you know what? I think it's safe to say this PS2 works. So we'll put this in the Good and functioning pile. Let's grab our next one. Okay, so this is our unique PS2, which has the PC card slot. Good noise. That one sounds much less grindy than the, uh, the gray one. Oh. The disk drive does not work and no video out. Okay, so this goes in the pile of shame. Next, PlayStation 2 number three. Ooh. Don't like that noise. That was, a, that's a good noise. The disc driving noise was not a good noise. The problem is, is that with a lot of older disc. You okay there, champ? No, I need a minute. It does seem like this drive is functional, but probably on its last legs. All right, let's move on to our next PS2. Oh. <laughs> This drive is stuck. You see it's try to move a little bit, but it doesn't, it doesn't open. So I guess you could say that we've got a 50-50 success rate on our functional PS2s and our broken PS2s. <laughs> so let's take a look at our Japanese N64s. I don't know what kind of N64 this is. It is a unique colorway because you can see it's still clear on the bottom, maybe slightly yellowed over the years, or maybe this is just the way it looked. But I will say this looks, I mean, besides that little thing that sounded like it's just rattling around on the inside, incredibly clean. This is gonna be a special occasion for me because I'm gonna play a game that I've never been able to play. When I was growing up, I did have the good fortune of owning an N64. And I owned Pokemon Stadium for the N64. So if you bought Pokemon Stadium from Japan, this was a completely different game than the one that we got here in the US. So let's try Pokemon <clears throat> Pocket Monster Stadium, the alpha version on our N64s and see if this works. Hey, hey, let's go! Oh, this is so different. Okay, all right, before we get too into this, actually, let's go ahead and shut this down. Let me swap everything over to our Ice Blue N64 and see if this one works. So both N64s work. Now let me finally play Pocket Monster Stadium Zero. Okay, now let me see if I can figure out what the name of these uh, moves are. Land it, land it boy! Let's go! No, it was Dream Eater! No! 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 My complete lack of Japanese knowledge has ruined me! I've been waiting to play this game for years, and the fact that that's the way it ends is deeply 
deeply disappointing. But my N64 is work, so... Boy, that was not good. <laughs> All right, so now we have the Sega Saturn. Now, a Japanese Saturn, I don't think is wildly different than the one we had here. It's definitely a different colorway. And I think these, are these buttons different? I, I think they might be. All right, everyone ready? Huh? Huh? Hey, it's 1994 again. Finally, I've been waiting 30 years. <laughs> oh, that's 30 years ago. Self burn. Wow. Wow. All right. Now, if you've never played Daytona USA, I do know that the Japanese version has different music than the English version. And I think the Japanese music is better. <laughs> Sorry, I just got into it. Let's play. Okay. Can I just say? Look how damn sharp that picture is. We're just going out straight through RCA directly into the TV. That looks like really good. Wow. Okay. So Daytona USA originally shipped in arcades and the Saturn was, I think the first time it left the arcade and was actually available at home. Dude, this is so sick for like 94, 95. This is so sick. Last lap, come on. Help me Tom Cruise. <laughs> Help me Oprah Winfrey. Woo, I'm drifting. I'm drifting, I'm drifting, oh, I hit a wall. Oh no, oh no, that's bad. If you ain't first or eighth. Daytona. Oh, well they just cut me off. All right, I guess the side it works. All right, so now let us try our Wii. Because it was so cheap, I'm gonna assume it doesn't work. And it is also in truly rough shape. But, well, here goes nothing. I'm not getting a signal, which is not filling me with confidence. Oh, what? whoa, 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 whoa. What? I fixed it! Do you just jiggle it? I jiggled the cable. All right. Um, the Wii remote does not work, but the Wii does. So I guess we need to go find our own Wii remote. Is that a copy of Smash? Wait, wait. Oh, <gasps> there's a copy of Brawl in here! That's my favorite Wii game! This is great! Let's go! Is that Yoshi? Oh! So I am, of course, the blue Game & Watch, the better version of Game & Watch. Now, were they level three CPUs? Yes, yes they were. But did my incredibly cheap Japanese Wii that accidentally came with a copy of Brawl completely and totally dominate? You damn straight. Next, let us try our Super Famicom. This one is quite dirty, but I think it may work. So we do have a copy of Donkey Kong 2, which we'll load up here. Here's the problem with that. I put force on it, it didn't go in. I put a little bit of force and it snapped in. Okay, now it went in correctly. All right, whatever. Nope. Ah. So you can see that something's coming through the TV because when I hit like the reset button and whatnot, the screen flickers. We're actually not getting any video signal out. We gotta keep in mind that this, along with a lot of the other consoles today, are coming from junk lots that are untested and considering how cheap these things were, is totally worth the gamble and maybe it's fixable. Um, and I got a bunch of Famicom controllers, I mean sorry, Super Famicom controllers and that is what I'm gonna say to make myself feel better. Let's move on, shall we, to the big chungus. And that's it, cause I'm not gonna tell you until episode two. Subscribe to the channel, suckers. That was all a gag, it was a ploy, it was a clever ruse. So you would think this is the end of the video, but it's not. There's one more video. And of course, huge thank you to Acronis for sponsoring today's video.